So it's my pleasure uh, this evening to uh, be able to uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. John Samara, and Dr. Samara is uh, an emeritus professor of psychology at Acadia University uh, out in Nova Scotia, and uh, he is also uh, a member of St. Joseph's Church, where uh, we often host Feast and Faith when we get to do it in person. And uh, John's had a, a long history of contemplation and uh, also working with people with disabilities. Uh, he has a, a passion for that as well. And um, I always think that when people have experienced disability in their own life, or they have walked with others who have various types of disabilities, uh, mental, physical, or otherwise, that it shapes their understanding of what it means to be human. And uh, it's one of the greatest ways to learn uh, more about yourself and uh, the way you do life as well. And so, uh, Dr. Samara, we are uh, glad that you could, could join us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. So tonight is going to be a Q&A a, a Q and, a, and uh, certainly would welcome you guys to start thinking about some of your, your com, uh, questions about um, the topic. I've labeled it psychology, Christianity, and the soul. It's a fairly uh, general label. But I thought where we could begin, uh, Dr. Samara, is to begin with a bit of your journey. And um, maybe you could share with us a little of how is it that you ended up in the field of psychology. Uh, tell us a little about the journey to, to studying psychology. Well, thank you for having me during Advent. Um, I imagine that the word waiting is uh, an anticipation is taking on new meaning these days. So it's, it's not just the anticipation of the vaccine, but the anticipation of more light in our lives and in our world so it's um liturgically for me quite a significant time really this this waiting period and hopeful anticipation so um growing up in the maritimes um i went uh, first to a catholic school for the first four years and i was uh, taught by religious women and um, then grade five, all the boys were told to go to the public school and girls continued <clears throat> with the sisters. So I went to public school. And then uh, at 17, I went off to university um, realizing that I had no idea of really uh, what I was doing, but my uh, brother and sister were both older than me had gone to university, so there didn't seem to be some question in the family about whether, I actually thought I might go into carpentry, but uh, those were the days, you know, when uh, kids were streamed. So I was streamed in the academic sector. And, um, so when I went to university, I realized that I had to register for something, but really um, I had no idea uh, what I was interested in or what I might be called to. So I went into the line that said uh, <clears throat> arts. And when I got to the Dean of Arts, he looked at my high school transcript and said, you should see the Dean of Science because your science marks are better than your arts marks. Um, so I went over to the Dean of Science and he said, we're interested in it. And I said, not science. <laughs> so he said, it sounds like you need to take a walk and think about what you'd like to do. So I took the university calendar with me on the walk and I looked up the disciplines because in high school, in those days, we weren't introduced to something called psychology. So I looked it up and it said the study of people. And I thought, well, that sounds, you know, reasonably vague enough and general enough. So I'm back to the Dean of Arts and said, well, I see psychology is listed under art, so I'd like to register for psychology. And that's how I ended up in psychology. 
So I did what was called an honors degree in psychology. I wrote a thesis, had a lot of subjects in psychology. And after I graduated, um, I was encouraged to go on in psychology. And uh, I wasn't ready to go on. Um, so I left and uh, I spent 10 years um, doing other things like um, I went to France and went to India and had a few years of different experiences, primarily with people with intellectual challenges. And I learned a great deal and uh, was very, very grateful for those lived experiences. Um, so then after 10 years of being away from, away from academia, um, I realized that I wanted to be more knowledge. So I decided to go into theology because I realized that my theology was dated and I wanted to get up to speed on <clears throat> especially, you know, moral theology but certainly systematic theology. And so I did a year at the Toronto School of Theology and I loved what I learned. But one of my professors <clears throat> um, said, you know, you have a psychology background and um, you might be interested in pursuing further work in psychology. And I that while my interest in theology was genuine and sincere, that as a person in the Catholic tradition, I wasn't likely to be able to make a living as a lay person. And I was married and with a family at the time. So I went into what was called counseling psychology at the University of Toronto. And uh, I spent uh, the next three and a half or four years um, doing counseling psychology. So that's kind of how I ended up with the discipline of psychology. And uh, from that point on then, I ended up practicing psychology as a counseling therapist. And also I had an academic position where I could research and write around uh, psychology and uh, especially in the area of disability. And now I'm retired living in Ottawa. So um, I was particularly intrigued uh, with Sid's title, you know, psychology, Christianity and soul, because <clears throat> of course I, I entered the field with an understanding that psychology was more than rats in a lab. But um, I discovered that there are many different types of psychologies. And so <clears throat> it's difficult to put everything in one category called psychology because it's so broad in scope, you know, experimental psychology developmental psychology, personality psychology, counseling psychology, and on and on the psychologies go. And uh, later on, if this is part of your question or reflection, I can share a little bit about the interesting history we've had in psychology. It is really quite... So I think I'll leave the personal background like that and just open it up. We're interested in your reflection on the topic and uh, would, wherever you are, I, you know, I've, I've taught for 40 years and what I've learned is, is if you talk, even if it's an interesting talk, but it's not about what's on people's minds and hearts, um, you know, it's better to where people are and what what their own reflections are and then engage them where they are other than me talk as I can for a whole hour. Interesting topic <laughs> it may not be relevant for you. So please feel free and uh, Sid can lead that conversation too. 
So I have a number of different rabbit trails that we could we could go down. But uh, when John and I were talking beforehand, uh, it really resonated uh, with me to to go exactly where he has just said we would go, and that is we could jump down the rabbit trails that you guys want to to go down related to the field of psychology or related to even some of what you've already heard from from John's story that that might take us uh, even a little ways away from psychology, but I'm sure we'll discover that they are all quite related. Um, and so I want to open it up to, to questions right off, uh, uh, right at this point. And uh, feel free to, to ask John anything you'd like to ask, and we'll go from there. And if you're intimidated to unmike, uh, unmute yourself, you can always put the question in the chat box and I can read it out for you. Have any of you had courses yet in psychology? Anyone with, with a course or two, intro psych or? I took intro psych. I'm taking another intro psych next semester. Oh, very good. I also took intro psych, but that was a number of years ago. What, what were you left with after the course? <laughs> what was your take on psychology? That's an interesting question. I mean, psychology, my, my mom is a marriage and family therapist. And so for me, sorry, can you not hear me well? You're good, you're good. Okay. Uh, my mom was a marriage and family therapist. So going into psychology, like taking the course, I was expecting to not learn that much. I was surprised how much brain science there mm -hmm. was in it. Um, so that side of things is interesting, um, but I would say I learned a lot more about how the brain works than I would have thought I would, a good thing, mm -hmm. and otherwise I also found that just the field in general is more interesting than I thought initially. Very good. Wow. The neuropsych area has really taken off the last decades or so you know so it's it's fascinating the brain study um, very good I have a question sure um, yeah I, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on how someone might know if they're good fit for psychology especially like a, I guess a clinical or, or counseling type like where you're actually with people, mm -hmm. how, how, yeah, how, if there's qualities that uh, help someone be good in that field? Yeah, good question. And uh, <clears throat> you know, as a cautionary note around my response, I think, and that is, uh, um, <laughs> Some ways we have to be careful who we talk to about this. <laughs> so, uh, because you're asking me the question, I'll I'll answer it my way. And this may not be a shared view of my many colleagues in psychology, um, because in in the field of psychology, I was. soft psychologist. I'm a registered psychologist. But soft as in, well, really interested in people and rapport and the nature of relationships and the nature of communication and who we are and how we are. Many of my colleagues were much more interested in, you know, randomized trials of subjects that is important statistically to know that, you know, the experimental group fared better than the control group in this thing or that thing. And it's a contribution and it makes good sense, but that's not why I entered psychology. So 
I entered psychology because I was really interested in the nature of personhood. What, what does it mean to be a person? Um, and even though that's philosophical, psychology has its origins in philosophy, not in science. Now, of course, uh, in your early universities, so you know, psychology is likely listed under not the arts, but it came out of philosophy. Because in a sense, we were asking similar questions. So I think someone who might be oriented uh, to the field that interested me and that I've been practicing for like several decades is just curious about human nature and curious about how we are as people. How, how is it that we think and how is it we feel and how is it our behavior is regulated or not? So for example, what thoughts, beliefs, and assumptions do I have to contribute to my mental health? But what thoughts, beliefs, and assumptions don't contribute to my mental health? Some emotions that I experience and how do I regulate those emotions to respect where I am, but also norms of society, right? So there's a like anger or rage, you know, road rage, I suppose, are, is a good example of, you know, anger that's out of control and it's not regulated. It's, you're angry, but you, you can't be hitting people. Um, so I think people that are interested in the basic question of the nature of personhood and people who maybe are naturally drawn to the importance of empathic relationships are probably some, some qualities or characteristics that I would look for who's, for someone who wants to be like a clinical psychologist or a counseling therapist or one of those helping area ones that they're, um, uh, it doesn't mean they're not interested in the brain, but it means that their primary focus is on how to facilitate communication and how to um, help people understand their own cognitions, head stuff, their own emotional life, heart stuff, and their own behavioral action life. Um, so I would say curiosity would be a big characteristic for me. You know, are you curious about how, how people tick? You know, what, what makes us tick, if I can put it kind of crassly there? Yeah, what makes us tick? Because I, I find this, I, and it shouldn't surprise us, I mean, it's certainly those of us who follow the way of Jesus, we know that we're the sons and daughters of God, so we're incredibly interesting, really. <laughs> you know, when you think of creation, um, we ought to be curious about creation. We ought to be curious about, well, these creatures that are called sons and daughters, what's, what are they like? What's their life story? And how do I engage them in that that helps in a way move their journey along as well, right? So does that help a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I like that answer. And yeah, it's because I, I feel like I hear a lot of people kind of say they're interested in psychology. I feel like it's a, a subject that's easy to be like, oh yeah, it's cool. You know, how, how people work is cool. But uh, yeah, and as someone who's not really sure about um, what kind of future career I might be going down, um, it's, it's good to hear from someone who's experienced. So, yeah. Thank you. Sure. In you Ottawa for the last little while, there's been like a well documented mental health crisis. Um, and the university has been taking measures to address it in different ways. Um, 
as someone, I guess, a little bit in Ottawa, so aware of what's going on, but not necessarily involved anymore. How would you, how do you respond to some of the stuff going on at the university? I guess it's a very general question, but I want to know your thoughts and what do you think would be some positive steps in the right direction? You're, you're talking about the mental health uh, issue? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a couple of reflections on that. Um, I just wrote a little piece for a Christian organization in uh, Atlantic Canada on, I think, topic that you're wanting to address now. I think that the reports I've read, and there are significant reports, uh, one by the Royal Society here in Ottawa, on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of Canadians. It's a really well evidence-based report that's available online. And um, I know a couple of people who have been involved in that. And uh, there are a lot of recommendations for federal, provincial, local governments to support funding for more mental health support. And uh, especially in the area of virtual care, right? So lots of people who want to see now a psychologist or a counselor or a therapist, um, they do it virtually, right? So um, they call it teletherapy, virtual therapy. So I appreciate that that's a way of supporting some people, not all people, but some people respond to that. I would like to, to address your question from a Christian perspective, uh, since the topic is psychology, Christianity, and soul. I think from a Christian perspective, one of the first things we realize is that we are all fragile. And that includes our mental health. Lots of people have mental health issues and uh, some have been identified and some are treated, et cetera, et cetera. But during the pandemic, I found, I found this personally, as well as with some of my friends who keep in touch, um, that our mental health is maybe more fragile than we thought. And that circumstances like isolation, social distancing, can, can see the rise of unexpected anxiety levels, fear, apprehension, uncertainty, doubt. Uh, we become less secure. And I think in the Christian tradition, um, we're aware that we've always been insecure and that we've always been fragile and that our poverty is actually God given. That is, that since we're poor, and of course we rely on other people to help us on our journey, this is natural and good, but we also are aware that we're even more dependent really on God than ever before because we, we have limits to our own abilities you know, intellectually, emotionally, etc. There are limits. And there are days during the pandemic I'm I'm widowed, you know, and I live alone. And, and there were there were days when I found myself nervous and anxious about the littlest of things. I thought this is so out of character for you. And I realized in my prayerful reflection that God was reminding me of my own poverty, my own fragility, that while I was raised and educated to be, you know, strong, kind of mentally, physically, etc., there were limitations, and I was being invited into a deeper spiritual relationship with my God, who kind of said, why did you think it would be otherwise? Like, because if we deny our fragility, especially around mental health, then I think we do become anxious. 
right? Because we're anxious about denial. And so my encouragement for this Christian community in Atlantic Canada was, let's at least be honest that most people are experiencing mental health issues and that we can accompany each other during this pandemic time by listening to each other's mental health concern. That is to say that now that mental health is in the public discourse, there's more opening and I hope sensitivity to we can talk about this now. We can talk about my nervousness, my anxiety, my fear, my apprehension, my moments of discouragement, my moments of depression, that it's okay to talk about those strong emotions because once they're shared, I think then some of the burden is lifted. And in the Christian community, the sharing of the burden for mental health is what I think will help people get through. We need to share it, but we need a way to share it with some certitude that we will be heard and appreciated and not judged for it. Um, you know, communication have said that we have five, basically five ways to respond to people when they share with us, you know, about their health. We can judge it, we can interpret it, we can question it, we can support it, or we can understand it. And in their research, they found that the most common everyday response was judgment. And the least common everyday response to a disclosure was understanding. And that helped me realize that people might want to share, but if they fear that their sharing will end up being judged or negated or denied, then they shut down again. And it's not surprising, given the research we have, that people are afraid to share about something as fragile as their mental health because, you know, the culture says, be strong or you'll get over this or come on, pull up your bootstraps, you know, take that British attitude. To... So I think, I think the pandemic and the current public discourse and our own Christian faith will help us engage more honestly and sincerely with one another so that we can journey, walk with each other during this, this moment of what I've seen in my friends and others is high levels of stress, high levels of anxiety. Um, you know, one or two have just recently said to me, they're scared, but even the sharing, right? sharing. And you notice uh, in scripture, Jesus says, come to me, all you are burdened, weary, I think is the translation, but come to me, all you are burdened, and I will give you rest. And he doesn't say, I'll solve your problem, or I'll fix it. He says, come and I will ease it. I will give you rest. And I think what we need, many of us, is people to ease the burden. Uh, and we ease the burden by encouraging it, encouraging it to be shared, but also appreciate it, kind of normalizing it as this is part of the human condition. Did that help with your question, Mel? Yeah, that was interesting, thanks. When it comes to the student mental health, um, how much do you think um, the university faculties should be responsible in providing resources and care? Um, should it be the university that provides things or should it be churches and community centers um, and specific centers for mental health? Or um, what are your opinions on the involvement of the university? Yeah, you know, I was 
during the university counseling center for a number of years. So I, you know, spent a lot of time with students and their mental health issues. Um, I mean, many student service uh, sectors of universities have ratios of how many counselors for how many students. So I don't know, you know, at your university what that ratio is, but um, so universities take some responsibility for that. And uh, now there's an increasing number, not only of students, but faculty. And, um, you know, you're interested in knowing that like a couple of people that I accompany on a regular basis are academics. Uh, because they don't feel the academy is necessarily a safe place for them to share. <laughs> so they share with me. So I think universities have a responsibility. Certainly the churches have a responsibility. But I would just say this. Go wherever you could get the help. Whether it's a friend, a pastor, a chaplain. Go where you get, get your need met. Um, could be a family member, could be a confidant, uh, somebody, somebody you trust, somebody you can share with and not be judged. Um, and not someone who's going to tell you what to do or how it's all going to be better tomorrow. Because what I found that most of us want is wherever we secure it, um, what most of us want is really to be heard and to be valued for the experience we've had. Uh, some of my well-intended friends, you know, when I go through my psychological stresses, and I have a few of them, um, but they'll, they'll say things like, you'll get over this, time heals. And you know, um, because they're my friends and they're well tended, I try to be a bit gracious, but it's not helpful. <laughs> you see, what I need is for my experience to be validated. I don't need someone to tell me to get over it. What I need is for someone to help me face it and hear it appreciate it, and help me integrate it into who I am. We don't get over our experience. We try to integrate it because our experiences shape us and we want them to integrate into us as, as the sons and daughters of God and who we are as people and who we are becoming as people. So I don't want someone to say, get over it. I want someone to say, let's face each other and let's see where you move along here. So I think universities, churches, communities, um, many, um, many people are going to provide, you know, resources for others. But it also takes courage, I think, to step out and kind of acknowledge, you know, um, that we are in need. Um, and whoever does that for us, we want them to have an open heart, just an open mind. But if I'm not welcomed into someone's heart, then I know I'm not really welcomed, you know? So I need to be welcomed into their life so that our experience together, our encounter and sharing and listening is a mutual enterprise. So when people talk to me now, of course, it's Skype or telephone or Zoom or whatever. You know, they'll thank me for listening, but I'll thank them for sharing because in that exchange, we were both lifted up. That's what makes those exchanges, especially around mental health, so mutually important. 
and you know sometimes uh, I mean not all the people I see are followers of Jesus but uh, for the ones who are you know I, I'll say uh, do you remember the story of the woman at the well this woman whose experiences were so different from Jesus comes and he has a way of helping her open up and then they have this honest really honest frank conversation and she leaves changed and uplifted but we don't often hear is Jesus was also changed interiorly he was impacted by her story right and so there's something in the sharing and the easing of our burden that invites a mutuality and relationship that I think we're very much in need of right now I can follow up on that John, um, you present an interesting uh, reflection in thinking about the place of the church with regards to uh, mental health, but also to how we, how we build communities and what it means to mediate Christ to one another. Um, it strikes me that churches have often got into this zone of fixing. Um, and we value the subject of healing. And therefore, when we, we meet people and they have a problem or they have uh, an illness or they have a, a host of whatever issues may be, uh, on some level, we see it all as sin and we want to get rid of it. We want it to be fixed. We want it to see the other side of it. How would you respond to to that mode of being within churches today. Would, if I hear you correctly, it, it, I wonder if at times we're too focused on getting rid of the problem instead of sometimes sitting with it and, and asking, how is God bringing this to us as a gift mm -hmm. in some way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's... <clears throat> You know, uh, probably in our history, right? Of, uh, I think um, the desire to help someone or um, be present to someone is is laudable and important, but I, I think that. The only way to allow mutuality into this discourse is that each of us spend some reflective time realizing how fragile we are, actually. So it's not the strong attending to the weak. It's the weak attending to the weak. And in the acknowledgement that we are both weak, vulnerable, fragile, use the adjective you want, that in that acknowledgement, something emerges. Well, when two or more are gathered in his name, there, you know, so something emerges and a grace can surface. But we need to realize that when we enter the encounter, it's not to fix or even cure. See, this, this curative notion was really like 20th century medical science, right? You diagnose it, then you cure it. But what we're finding even in medical science is there are a lot of things that don't have a cure. And some things you have to kind of learn to live with, right? So uh, I think that got transferred over maybe to some Christian ministries that kind of saw some people as strong or dominant and so the other people who were weak and subordinate they were served the thing that i learned most in my 30 years of working with people with intellectual disabilities is that i lived with and learned from so it's easy to in our culture see things as strong and weak but in the christian tradition 
happy are the poor in spirit, it's not surprising Jesus starts off with poverty, right? We are poor. This, this is our need. doesn't mean we walk around with our heads down or that we have, you know, self parties on a regular basis. That, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, happy are those who depend on my Father. Happy are those who are poor in spirit. So sometimes I think my poverty is so great that I, I don't realize that even my poverty belongs to God. That the knowledge of who I am, John, and who I am becoming, is hidden in God. Only God knows this. I don't know it. My friends don't know it. That knowledge is hidden in God. And so we are poor because we are totally reliant. We are totally reliant. And sometimes we're conscious of it and sometimes not. And, uh, but we are we're very, very poor. But when, when fragility meets fragility, or poverty meets poverty, or vulnerability meets vulnerability, then I think closeness happens. I think we get close when we're actually open, vulnerable with each other, right? We're not close if one is strong, the other's weak, and so then the one weak says, why can't I be that strong? And the strong one says, why are you so weak? Get over that. But when vulnerability, each of us is aware of how poor and vulnerable we really are at the core. We can't solve our family problems. We can't solve our children's problems. We can't solve our spousal problems. We can't solve our the student I'm living with problems. Then where do we go? You know, where do we go? So we share with each other. But a lot of my conversations today, my honest conversations are with God. Because <laughs> I know that that's one certain place where I will be loved as I am and judged for my sharing of my fragile mental health state. Um, and that's what I try to address to the Christian group in Atlantic Canada was if we could get to the point where we saw some of our ministries in that light rather than doing this for this person, then we might have a different experience of mutuality and of grace. Um, some of my best sessions with people have been when I have not been strong at all, when I have been physically weak, uh, intellectually a bit dull, uh, distracted. But what it brought was well, this is, this is what I am right now. This is, <laughs> this is my experience right now. And when we're able to be, I think, that open and honest with each other, I think grace is given. I really, I really count on that. And that's from my experience. Yeah, what comes to mind when you say that, John, is that image in the Garden of Eden uh, where it describes Adam and Eve as being naked and without shame. And it always strikes me a little odd that people want to emphasize that simply from a marriage standpoint, that this is a, this is a calling in terms of what the, the ultimate marriage looks like. And I always read that and I think, oh, this is much bigger than just about a marriage relationship, though a good marriage relationship should epitomize that. But that idea of being naked and without shame as the ideal state of humanity uh, in that mutuality, that's, that's the garden description of Christianity right there. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Other questions? I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on um, like comparing like therapy to Christian therapy and just like um, 
on the one hand or the one extreme, there could be like more factual or like scientific methods of like fixing things. I don't think that's the right way to put it. But then on the other hand, there could be like, um, yeah, maybe Christian therapy. Sometimes they just tell you, oh, just like go and pray about it and then everything will be better. And they're not actually like helping them, um, yeah, get out of their problems. Um, yeah. Wondering your thoughts on that and like finding a balance between those two. Yeah, I think it's probably important actually what you're sharing there. So I'll just uh, briefly give my take on it. Um, <clears throat> certainly there are uh, people in groups called Association of Christian Therapists. And so they practice from a particular Christian faith perspective. Um, there are people that are really biblical, biblically centered therapists. So they feel like most psychological problems have some biblical source that you can go to. And if you, you know, stick with the Bible and what the Old Testament and New Testament say, that that would be good. And I understand that. I, what I want to share, though, is kind of personal because... I am a follower of Jesus, but I am not a Christian therapist. So my identity is as a follower. My faith, and my Christian faith in particular, has helped with people who want their faith incorporated into therapy. They want to know that if they share about their relationship with God, that it'll be heard and respected, encouraged, maybe even used in the therapeutic intervention. So those people come because I'm a psychologist who happens to be a Christian. The other people come who would be offended that I ever mentioned the Bible or faith of any kind. And I appreciate them all. I think that our common ground here is human beings, like we are human beings. And I want to go to someone who will respect my views, whatever they are, and be helpful with interventions that are actually sound that there's, you know, we have some evidence for. <laughs> this is a well-researched field, by the way. Um, you know, I want people who are current and understanding, and we're talking about professional people now. So I would rather go to someone who is helpful than someone who's just identified as this, because you can assume. So, for example, in the community where I live, which is a very small rural community in Nova Scotia, because it was no one that I went to church, there were people who didn't seek me out as a therapist because they prejudged me as, well, then you, you won't be open to sexual orientation. You won't be open to... They prejudged me without knowing me, really. And I felt deprived, really, because I have a pretty open mind and a pretty open heart, <laughs> even though I'm clear about who I follow. But I don't think it's so much the label, like often in my case, my students too would say, well, you know, what, what do we call you? Like, are you a therapist? Are you a counselor? Are you a psychologist? Are you a counseling psychologist? Are you a clinical psychologist? I said, you know, whatever kind of pleases you, because that's not what interests me. What interests me is, can I engage with you in a way that's actually therapeutic? Can I engage with you in a way that would help you address what you need to address honestly, sincerely? and offer some assistance along the way. So I'm much more interested in 
encounter and engagement that I am about, you know, go and see a Christian therapist because you're a Christian. I hope that works out for you. I mean, I know a couple of really good ones, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm more interested in the nature of the work than the actual titles, right? Um, but you know, someone comes and says, you know, do you think there's a scripture passage that would help? I'd say, yes, I do actually. <laughs> you know, and if this helps in your therapy, by all means. Uh, but, you know, there are others who need something else and because of their sensitivity, they would be offended if I, you know, I want to make sure that we're open and uh, not close any doors as some people have with me because I am a Christian. And some of my academic colleagues, um, you know, a few, uh, wondered why I'm in the academy. Because I was one a psychologist and two a Christian. And it kind of, in a second university, that didn't add up, you know? So I understood that as a lack of knowledge and awareness around well, what faith was and what psychology was, but I also interpreted it quite personally, that it wasn't so much them being ridicule, ridiculing or criticizing me as it was me being inv invited by God to see this as part of my poverty as a professional, that I will not always be understood and that that's just fine. That's just fine. It's the nature of the work and the nature of the work, you know, um, um, we don't have time to get into the history of psychology, but you know, our, our history, the word psychology comes from the Greek word psych, P-S-Y-C-H-E, psyche. And the Greek translation the translation from the Greek word psyche actually means soul. So we started off like 130 years ago with the study of the soul. Sigmund Freud, who you may have heard through your studies, he was kind of the founder of modern day psychology. And uh, Freud while he spoke and wrote English, he did not bother to translate his German work because he didn't feel that people in America would understand what he was writing about. So he left the translation to them and Psyche did not get translated as soul, but translated as mind, right? So Freud, whom everybody sees as like the sex person, the new understanding of Freud is that he actually started us off with, when he said psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, when you break it up, is a reflection of the soul. For him, that's what psychoanalysis was, reflection of the soul. So just to bring this in to kind of current times, in one of the letters he wrote, to Carl Jung, another big name kind of in psychology and the founder of the New Age movement. And he wrote a letter to Carl Jung saying, psychoanalysis is basically a cure through love. Now there are very few clinical people who would ever say that today, but that was Freud's understanding. It's a reflection of the soul secure through love. So therapy is a reflection of what's going on in the mind, beliefs, assumptions, attitudes, etc. But also emotional life and behavioral life. 
that all of these things that kind of got translated as mind and then behavior are really from our origin all about the soul. I think we're at a time when we might be reclaiming a bit some of the soul literature. I noticed some psychology books now have a little section on psychology and spirituality. They include it under the topic of cognition because they don't dare want to have it as a separate, you know, <laughs> separate topic. But, but in a way, I think what the current understanding is, is trying to bring psychology and spirituality together. That when you reflect on the soul, you are using mental processing and emotional regulation and behavioral analysis, etc. But that the soul, the way Freud and the modernists understood it, was the essence of the core of the person. But in a postmodern time, most universities now are very postmodern. In postmodern times, there's no regard for essence or core. That's seen as a modernist notion. But some of us still hold the view that while postmodernism, with its emphasis on relativity and subjectivity and, you know, ethnicity and et cetera, et cetera, is really important, that in throwing out the soul, it's kind of another way of the discipline saying, well, psychoanalysis had its field day in the early part of the 20th century, and then people critiqued it, and that was the end of that. Then the behaviors came along, and they had a good run at it, and then the cognitivists came along, and they got rid of behaviorism, and they're having a field day. What we've not done well in psychology is build on each other's systems of understanding. We've criticized the one to promote our own. But now I think, and there are you know, big thinkers like Ken Wilber and others who are saying it's time for integral psychology. It's time for psychology to be more integrated rather than fragmented. So that's what I look for kind of in a, a therapist. That's a roundabout way of getting to I want a therapist who appreciates more the integrity of what it means to be a person and not just be concerned about my behavior or even my feelings. I mean, I want someone to understand and appreciate my feelings of discouragement, but I also want them to help me go a little bit farther than that, to say, what's the significance of your feelings? What's the significance of your thoughts? What's the significance of your actions or your lack of actions? What are you being called to in this, you know? So I think integral psychology is kind of on the move today and that's a whole other topic that I'm encouraged. And uh, I think there's a, a lot more room now for appreciating various systems rather than just throwing them out so Freud now, you may be interested, 150 years later, Freud now in the neuropsychology field and brain studies, what we're getting is research on what happens to the brain when you go through therapy. We actually have scans now that can show what happens neurologically. And these neurons, you know, they can be looked at. So we technology now that Freud didn't have. And the technology is showing that the talking cure that he talked about, the talking cure actually impacts the brain. Not just, I feel good because I shared this. It actually has a neurological impact, right? And I often am amused, you know, when people only think of Freud as sex. Because Freud was really soul, but he never got credit for that. So that's a little bit of our history. <laughs> I see by the clock that it is uh, 10 after 7, um, but I'd like to be able to uh, see if there are any final questions yet. Um, 
because now's your opportunity. So if there's something you'd like to ask, please feel free to, to do that. We can maybe take one or two questions. Or maybe people are ready to be done at this point in time, which is perfectly fine too. John, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it is always a gift and it is always uh, uh, an enjoyment to hear your reflection, uh, not just on psychology, but a reflection on what it means to be human. Uh, I usually find myself with uh, a number of things that I ponder in the days that follow whenever you are with us. One of the takeaways for me tonight is is that uh, I think I owe my wife an apology because I think uh, I, I've been doing a little bit too much judging and not enough understanding lately. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I want to wish you all well in your studies, but uh, as importantly, I wish you well in life, you know, wherever your life leads you. And uh, I pray and trust that you'll be led where you need to be led and uh, it'll be good. It'll be good. So thanks very much for having me, especially during that. Thanks, Ed. Thank you so much.